today I want to get into a little more detail about my particle model. Now, as you may recall from my previous videos, I use this symbol, the yin yang symbol, as a as the symbol for and or schematic of my particle model. And this is why I use the term the ohm particle for my particle model because the yin yang symbol is associated with um, with Eastern traditions and Buddhism, and uh, the term ohm, the sound of ohm, is also associated with the Eastern religions and uh, Buddhism in particular. And so um, I refer to my particle model as the ohm particle model. This, of course, is a scalable model in the fractal sense, and so if this is um, the model of an electron, then this could be uh, the model of a proton, and this could be the model of some other uh, unknown particle, maybe associated with dark matter um, that exists in nature. The yin yang symbol uh, depicts a, is depicting a spin of some sort, so we can assume that uh, this is a spinning model, that the spinning model is spinning at a certain frequency, and that, um, as I talked about in other videos, this outer perimeter is associated with the Compton wavelength of the particle, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we move forward. So in the previous video, I showed you this animation, and this is from the uh, work of John Mackin. And so I've been studying his work quite intensively because there are a lot of things in his work that is very compatible with, uh, with my, uh, the model that I'm proposing. And so he's got this animation of a, um, a vortex, a spinning vortex. Let's go back. And so you can see that in his vortex, there's a hill and there's a valley and that the, the hill and the valley are spinning about a um, central point, much like this yin-yang symbol is spinning here. And so, um, so I think that, so I was able to reinterpret, I was able to reinterpret the yin-yang symbol as a, uh, one side being a hill and the other side being a valley and the hill and the valley spinning. Um, this would be a spinning wave with a peak and a valley spinning about a central point. And so I, I thought his model was uh, very interesting and, and looks very much like what I've been looking for in terms of interpreting this, uh, this symbol, this schematic, which I am um, associating with my particle model. So in the previous video, I also showed you the work of uh, Bob Greener in the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, and um, he's working with a group of people that are doing experiments in low-energy nuclear reactions, a.k.a. cold fusion. And so in their experiments, they're seeing something very similar uh, to the vortex structure of, um, of uh, John Mackin, only they're seeing something just a little bit different. And so I thought this was really interesting. So basically what he's showing here is a hill and a valley, much like uh, we're seeing here. Only the, the hill has a valley in the center and the valley has a hill in the center. And uh, so this actually was uh, it, I'm able to actually reinterpret the yin yang symbol as not just a hill and a valley, but um, a hill with a valley and a valley with a hill. And so, um, so this actually gives me a little bit more information in terms of interpreting the yin yang symbol. And so, uh, I'm going to play for you what he uh, has to say about this. Actually, um. I have this image here, which I drew as a proposal, uh, and it's here, and I've cut through my aluminium virtually, I'll get rid of my mugshot, and this is the flat plane of the aluminium, and this is the pit with the raised bit in the centre, and then it goes up to the raised cone, and then they've got the bit in the centre, and then down. Actually, um... Okay, so he's got a 
hill with a valley and a valley with a hill. And he also goes on to say that um, there are vortices going on in this hill and valley, this um, extra hill and valley. So the hill has a valley with a vortex and the valley has a hill with a vortex. So that would imply that the little dots here are vortices in of themselves. And so you could maybe in the fractal sense, put a little yin yang in these little dots and, um, and get the um, structure that Bob Greener is showing in this image. So in my particle model, the outer circumference of the yin yang symbol is associated with the Compton wavelength of the particle. And so um, you can see how the circle, in this animation, you can see how the circle is associated with the wavelength of a wave. And so this model can actually be applied to both a particle model, a spinning particle model, and a wave model if you associate one turn of the um, once around the circle as one wavelength. And so these, these are both just schematics again. This is a schematic of my particle model and the outer circumference is the Compton wavelength. And this is the wave interpretation of the Compton wavelength. So in order to understand my particle model, you also have to have a bit of an understanding of modified unit analysis, which is my interpretation of unit analysis. So in modified unit analysis, I add the uh, radian and the cycle to the unit analysis. And I uh, specifically state that two pi has the units of radians per cycle. And so this puts both the radian and the cycle into the language of unit analysis. And so, um, of course, we know what a cycle is. A cycle is once around the circle. So when you see this delta symbol here, I want you to think of one complete turn around the circle, okay? Or one complete wavelength, okay? If you want to use this interpretation. When you think of radian, I want you to think of a partial turn around the circle. So a radian is an angle such that the um, arc length along the circle is exactly equal to the radius of the circle. And so I talked about this before, but this is an important point. Um, my particle model is, uh, a, uh, is focused on cycles and not radians. So I am not going to use um, angular frequency because angular frequency is uh, written in terms of radians. So it is radians per cycle or radians per second and not cycles per second. So it's very important that um, you understand that I am trying to do all of physics in terms of, what, of complete cycles once around the circle is one complete cycle, one radian is a partial cycle. And so nature is not quantized by the radian. Nature is, quant is um, quantized by one complete cycle. So it's quantized by the cycle. So again, the Compton wavelength of a particle is the distance, the arc length distance around the circle, around at the outer edge of my yin yang symbol. And it is uh, functionally identical to one wavelength if this was a wave. And so what does the NIST standard have to say about the Compton wavelength? Okay, so in the NIST standard, the Compton wavelength is equal to 2.426 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So, uh, but this is actually the Compton wavelength of the electron. For some reason, they don't, they just call this the Compton wavelength in the NIST standard. They don't say that it is the Compton wavelength of the electron, but this is in fact the Compton wavelength of the electron. So in my model, this is the um, arc length of the outer circumference of my yin-yang model. 
um, is exactly this distance, 2.426 times 10 to the minus 12. Now you'll also notice that the NIST standard has this in terms of uh, the units in terms of meter, but in modified unit analysis, the, um, the unit for the wavelength or the circumference of a circle is meters per cycle. So this is the distance of this outer circle um, in if this is an electron. Now interestingly, in the NIST standard, the proton also has a Compton wavelength and they actually call it the proton Compton wavelength. So the proton Compton wavelength is 1.321 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, but in modified unit analysis, it's 1.321 meters per cycle. So this is the distance around the outer circumference of my proton model. Okay, so I just think it's interesting that the NIST standard um, does not re refers to the Compton wavelength of the electron as just the Compton wavelength, but they refer to the Compton wavelength of the proton as the proton Compton wavelength. So um, for completeness, and for, you know, because this is a standard, they should follow a standard. And so really this should be called the electron Compton wavelength. And of course that is what I will be doing in my, um, in my teachings. So in my own particle model, I define a few constants of nature. Okay, the first uh, constant I define is the quantum of mass. Now the quantum of mass is the mass associated with one complete cycle. So if this is a spinning vortex, then um, and the spinning vortex is the cause of the mass of the particle, then the quantum of mass is the mass associated with one complete turn. Okay, and so uh, the quantum of mass is calculated using um, Planck's constant divided by the speed of light squared, and um, it is equal to 7.37 times 10 to the minus 51. Now the units of this in, in modified unit analysis are um, kilograms times seconds per cycle. Okay, so, and this interprets as the mass of one uh, period of the cycle. And so one period of the cycle is, of course, one turn of the cycle. And so in, quant in modified unit analysis, um, H over C squared interprets as the mass of one complete cycle, one period of time of this spinning vortex. Now, when you look at the NIST standard for, when you look for this value, the 7.372 times 10 to the minus 51, in the NIST standard, you find something called the Hertz kilogram relationship. And the units for the Hertz kilogram relationship, this value that I call the quantum of mass, is actually kg, kilogram. So somehow, somehow um, the NIST standard is saying that H over C squared, which is a constant, has the units of kilogram. But when you map it out, of course, I say it's kilogram times second per, per uh, cycle. But in, in the standard, okay, first of all, the standard doesn't have a cycle term. So in the NIST standard, the units for, if you actually map out the units for this, you're going to find that it has the units of kg kilogram times second which is very difficult to interpret. What is kilogram times second? Okay, so I'm gonna put a little circle around this. So this is what the, um, if you calculate the units from H over C squared using standard unit analysis, you actually get kilogram times second. So how do they get kilogram out of kilogram times second? Well, they multiply, they multiply this constant by the unit of frequency, which gets rid of this S, and then they state that the units of this, of H over C squared, are kilogram. Now this seems very hokey to me because 
Um, units are one thing, constants are another thing, variables are another thing. And so in, in modified unit analysis, I would never multiply a unit, uh, a constant by a unit to get um, a unit that makes sense. Like it seems like they really made a mistake here. And this is why I don't trust the uh, legacy standard. I don't trust it because they do kind of hokey stuff like this. So in the own particle model, I have another quantum um, constant, which I refer to as the quantum of momentum. Okay, so this is the momentum of one complete cycle. So if this is a particle, if this is an electron, then this is the momentum of one complete turn of this vortex model. Okay, so, and uh, I calculate this using H over C, using Planck's constant over C, and when you take Planck constant and divide it by the speed of light, you get 2.21, etc., times 10 to the minus 42. So in modified unit analysis, this works out to uh, the momentum times S over delta, which is the momentum and, and seconds per cycle is the unit of the period. And so like the quantum of the mass, quantum of mass, this is the quantum of momentum and it is the momentum of one complete turn of my own particle model. Okay, so this is the momentum of, of means times, the momentum times one period means this is the momentum of one complete period of this spinning model. But in the NIST standard, when you go looking for this value, um, which is H over C, 2.210 times 10 to the minus 42, they have the units as kilogram. Now this seems really strange to me because they have um, the unit of um, the H over C squared has units of kilogram and H over C has the units of the kilogram in the NIST standard. So this seems really strange to me. This is very hokey. And so how did they come up with the units of kilogram? Well, in the standard units, uh, first of all, the standard units don't have the delta. So in standard units, you would have kilogram meters per squared times S. They would cancel the S and they would end up with units of kilograms times meter. Well, the kilo kilogram times meter is very hard to interpret. And so to get rid of this M term in the units, they again, they multiply the con beautiful constant H over C by um, the inverse of the meter. So one over meter gets rid of this meter and they, they claim that the units of H over C have the units of kg. Again, this seems very hokey to me, and this calls into question uh, all of the unit analysis associated with the um, these quantum constants, with these constants um, h over c and h over c squared, and it also makes me wonder if they got h wrong as well, which of course I've talked about quite a bit in my previous videos. So in the Ohm particle model, I have three quantum constants, the quantum of mass, and this is the mass associated with one complete turn of my Ohm particle model. I have the quantum of momentum, which is the momentum of one complete turn of my own particle model, and I have a quantum of energy, which is um, exactly equal to Planck's constant, and this is one, the energy associated with one complete turn of my own particle model. The own particle model also has two equations associated with it. And I've reworked these equations to be in terms of power and force, okay? And so um, basically to do that, what I had to do was take the energy and momentum equation and divide both sides by S, 
by s. Okay, so that gets rid of this s here, and so um, the quantum of mass then has units, um, so it gets rid of this. So if I divide both sides by s, then the units of quantum of mass are kilogram per cycle, which is the same thing, so it's the mass of one complete cycle. So it's either the mass of one complete period or the mass of one complete cycle. And I do the same with quantum of momentum. I write a, a force equation where I divide, divide both sides by s, and so the units um, of quantum momentum are actually momentum per cycle, and the units of energy are energy per cycle, and this is the energy of one complete cycle. So the meaning of these constants doesn't change. Uh, it's just how um, it allows me to write a... Um, power equation and a force equation instead of an energy equation and a momentum equation. So the reason I do this is because power equations and force equations are more useful when you're trying to solve problems. When you're trying to solve a problem, you really want to know how much power was delivered and you want to know how much force is going to be applied to a particle. And so um, I rewrite my equations in terms of power and force. And now, um, so the units of frequency are cycles per second. And the units of the quantum of energy, which is Planck's constant, is um, the energy per cycle, the energy per one complete turn. And uh, the units of quantum of momentum are now the uh, momentum of per cycle or the momentum of one complete turn. And so the meaning of the quantum of energy and quantum momentum don't change, just the units are reworked a little bit so that I can write the equations in, ter in terms of power and force. So this is my particle model, okay, but it can also be applied to waves. And I refer to this as wave particle unity. And so this is sort of my ohm particle model is a play on ohm as a sound, so it's a play on wave particle duality, but I don't refer to it as a duality, I refer to it as a unity. So the, the same equations and the same constants can be used for both particles, let's say the electron, and for waves, propagating waves in the medium for the propagation of light. So the electron is a standing wave which is propagating in place, and light is a propagating wave, a traveling wave, propagating in space. Light propagates in space. Particles like the electron and the proton propagate in place. And that is the only difference between a particle and, um, say, like an electron and light in uh, my model. Now, I don't have a photon in my model. I have um, standing waves and propagating waves, and light is a propagating wave in my model. So we can use these equations to solve real-life problems, and that is what we're going to do right now. So here is a real life example. Given a 0.516 watt laser emitting light with a wavelength of 726 nanometers, what force would the light emitted by such a laser exert on an external object? Okay, so here's how we're gonna solve this problem. First, we're going to convert to the frequency domain. Okay, because you can see that this is written in terms of nanometers, and we want this to be in terms of frequency, because my equations need frequency. So we're going to convert to the frequency domain. We're going to calculate the non-amplified power, and that's what this equation is. This equation is the non-amplified power of a uh, light being emitted by an atom of some sort. Okay, so we're going to calculate the non-amplified power. Then we're going to calculate the ampli amplification factor of the laser. Then we're going to calculate the non-amplified force. And that's what this is. So this is the non-amplified force um, of light being emitted by an atom of some sort. And then we're going to calculate the amplified force uh, created by the laser. 
<clears throat> so to convert to the frequency domain, first we need to convert to meters. And of course, in, uh, in modified unit analysis, the wavelength is, has units meters per cycle. So we have to convert to meters per cycle. And so 726 nanometers is 7.26 times 10 to the minus 7 meters per cycle. Okay, so then we convert to the um, frequency domain by taking the speed, uh, dividing uh, the speed of light by the wavelength, by this value. And uh, so you get a frequency of 4.129372 times 10 to the 14th cycles per second. So we have converted to the frequency domain. Okay, so now we can calculate the non-amplified power by taking this frequency, okay, taking this frequency and multiplying it by the quantum of energy. And so here we do that. So the power, and this is the non-amplified power, this is the power of light that is emitted from the atoms that um, has not been amplified by the laser. And so that's what this equation is for. This equation calculates the non-amplified power. And so it is power equals the frequency, which we just calculated times basically Planck's constant, which is the quantum of energy. And so you end up with 2.73, etc., times 10 to the minus 19th watts. Okay, so this is the uh, power, non-amplified power, if you didn't amplify it uh, using a laser. So now we are going to use this value to calculate the amplification factor. So in our original problem, given a 0.516 watt laser, so to calculate the amplification factor, you take 0.516 watts and divide it by my non-amplified um, value that we just calculated. And you end up with an amplification factor of 1.88, etc., times 10 to the 18th. Now this has no units because you are uh, dividing watts by watts. So the output of my calculation here was in watts, and the 0.516 is in watts, and so this amplification factor is just that, an amplification factor. It has no units. So now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the non-amplified force. Now we're going to do that using my second equation, which is force is equal to the frequency times the quantum of momentum. The quantum of momentum was Planck's constant divided by the speed of light. Okay, so um, we are going to use the frequency that we calculated before, but instead of multiplying it by the quantum of energy, we're going to multiply it by the quantum of momentum. And so you're going to end up with um, 9.126, etc., times 10 to the minus 28 newtons. Okay, so if you do the unit analysis using modified unit analysis, you're going to end up with the units of, of force. Okay, so this is the non-amplified force. This is the force that would be exerted on an object if you didn't amplify it using the laser. Okay, so now we're going to calculate the final force by taking this value here. Okay, we're going to take this value here and multiply it by the amplification factor, which we calculated here. Okay, and we are going to end up with um, the final force, the force of the laser, is the non-amplified force times the amplification factor, and that is equal to 1.7211, etc., times 10 to the minus 9. And that, of course, is the correct value. Now, in, you know, in the standard model, you would calculate that. You would take the power and divide it by the speed of light, and you would get this answer here. But this equation here doesn't give you any sort of idea of why um, there is a force. And so you can either shut up and calculate and use this formula, or you can go through the logic that I took you through to try and understand why, um, why there is a force even in the first place, because we're talking about light. So how can light exert a force? 
In the own particle model, this equation can be applied to both, um, both particles and light. Now, it is well known that light does have momentum, and so, but it's a little bit harder to understand. It's easy to understand why a particle has momentum. It's a little bit harder to understand how light has a, mat has a momentum. And so I want you to think of it this way. So um, water waves, of course, have momentum. When the wave crashes into the shore, that momentum can be converted into a force. And so the wave itself doesn't have mass. So why does light not have mass? Because light is a wave. How much does a water wave uh, weigh? So uh, that's a good question to ask yourself. And so a water wave doesn't have mass in of itself, but it does have momentum because the wave is propagating. And only when the wave crashes onto the shore does that momentum get converted into a force. Okay, so uh, this equation can be applied to both matter and to light as well as the energy equation. Okay, the energy equation can also be applied to both uh, particles like electrons and to light waves. And now I'm not going to use the word photon because photons uh, aren't in the language of the own particle model or in modified unit analysis. So there is no such thing as a photon in the own particle model. In the own particle model, I rewrote Planck's energy equation in terms of power, and I interpret this as the power of the unamplified uh, signal. So this is the signal that would be emitted from the atom um, before it gets amplified. Okay, so um, I interpret this much differently. So in this interpretation of um, Planck's energy equation, there is no room for a photon. The output of this equation is the non-amplified power, and power, of course, has units joules per second. So this is on a per second basis, and I also have a companion force equation, which interprets similarly as the, um, as the momentum uh, per second. And so these equations written this way, and of course I was able to solve the problem of the, the um, I was able to solve the laser problem using these equations here and with my reinterpretation of these equations where uh, the output of this equation is not the energy of a photon, but is the power of the non-amplified signal. So here is another example, and it is based on a radio transmission. And so um, here is the problem. Uh, so this is how um, photons, the term photon, came into being. And this is based on the, I believe, incorrect interpretation of Planck's energy equation. I believe Planck's energy equation should have been written originally in terms of power, since all of the black body experiments were um, were reported in terms of power. They were reported in terms of intensity, and intensity is watts per meter uh, squared. And so, um, but this is how the idea of photons came into being. Okay, so an FM radio transmitter has a power output of uh, 100 kilowatts and operates at a frequency of 94 megahertz. So that's the frequency, and this is the power. How many photons per second does the transmitter emit? Okay, so a photon of frequency uh, 94 megahertz has the energy of. So if you use their interpretation, their equation e equals hf, okay, you get a um, you get the value of 6.23 times 10 to the 26 joules. And then the radio transmitter emits energy at a rate of 100. Uh, kilojoules per second. So that is the power. And so uh, to calculate the number of photons they take um, per unit time, they take the energy per unit time, okay, they take the energy per unit time and divide it by, so the energy per unit time is this va value here, and they divide it by the energy per photon, supposedly, that this equation gives, and you end up with 1.61 times 10 to the 30, and the units work out to per second. So uh, it works out to, so I guess this would be interpreted as the number of photons per second. So 
Given the standard unit analysis, this makes sense, and this is how the uh, idea of the photon came into being. Okay, so 1.61 times 10 to the 30 photons per second is a heck of a lot of photons for one thing, but uh, regardless, that is how the idea of the photon came into being. Um, but I can uh, reinterpret this. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same method I used uh, and use the equations that I used um, in the previous example to solve this problem. So first I'm going to convert to the frequency domain, which is um, the frequency of the signal is 9.4 times 10 to the 7 cycles per second. Then I'm going to calculate the non-amplified power. So... Um, the non-amplified power, so the equation, so this equation here, I'm rewriting as a power equation I'm interpreting as the non-amplified power, and so this value, 6.23 times 10 to the minus 26 um, joules in the standard, in the um, legacy standard, uh, is uh, has this value here, so 6.23 times 10 to the minus 26, um, this has the units of power. And so this is the non-amplified power in the Ohm particle model. This is the non-amplified power, and these are the units in uh, modified unit analysis. So Planck's constant has the units of joules per cycle. Okay, that is the, I'm just going to copy this into here so we can see it. So this is the energy of one turn or one cycle, okay? Um, and then we multiply by the frequency and we get this value here, here. So frequency has units, cycles per second. So this is the number of times this model turns in one second. So, and this model turning could create a wave which has a certain frequency and a certain wavelength, etc. And so um, now we calculate the amplification factor by taking the um, value here, the 100 kilojoules, which is uh, 100,000 joules, and we divide that by the um, power factor, or sorry, the non-amplified power that we just calculated, and we end up with 1.61 times 10 to the 30 uh, watts per watt. So this is an amplification um, factor. So in, in the uh, own particle model and modified unit analysis, this interprets as the amplification factor of the radio signal. And obviously radio signals need to be amplified in order to be transmitted, in order to transmit and of any distance. And so um, this amplification is very similar to, if not identical to, the laser amplification, only radio sig the wavelengths of radio waves are much, much longer. So the frequencies are much, much uh, shorter than a gamma ray or an X-ray or a very high energy um, uh, wave. And so that is how I solve the problem uh, I understand how they interpret this as a photon and how they interpret um, this is the energy of a photon, but in reality, this is the energy of one second worth of um, energy units that are being emitted from, say, a single atom. So a single atom can only emit a certain amount of energy, then you have to amplify it in order to um, get a radio transmission, or you have to amplify it in order to uh, generate a high power laser. So I'm going to take this one step further and calculate the force associated with this uh, radio transmission signal. So to do that, I'm going to do it the same way I did with the laser experiment. Okay, so I'm going to calculate the unamplified force using um, my equation. Uh, force is equal to frequency times the quantum of momentum. And when you do that, you get this value here. So this value here is uh, has units of uh, force or the Newton. So frequency has unit cycles per second. Quantum of momentum has units of momentum per cycle. Of course, these cancel, and these add up to the units of force. And so then we can calculate the amplified force. 
So this is the force of the amplified signal, the actual radio signal that's being transmitted. You take the unamplified force and you multiply it by the amplifi amplification factor that we calculated a few slides back and uh, you get a force of 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. Now this uh, was not part of this example so I don't know if this is the right answer. If I made a mistake um, please let me know. I did this quickly at the last minute and so it looks like the, this radio signal would exert a fairly small force on an object of 3.33, etc., times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. So as you can see, I was able to use the same approach in both the laser example and the radio wave example. Uh, first you convert to the frequency domain, then you calculate the non-amplified power, then you cal calculate the amplification factor, and then the non-amplified force, and then you calculate the final force um, using the amplification factor. And so I was able to apply this logic to both of those problems and without ever having to invoke um, the language of the photon. There is no photon in, um, in this language that I am proposing for solving these kinds of problems. So what I'm proposing here is not necessarily a new physics, but a new language, an alternate language. Okay, so Richard Feynman said, there's always another way to say the same thing that doesn't look at all like the way you said it before. In the language that I'm proposing, I don't need a photon. I don't need the concept of a fundamental particle, the photon as a fundamental particle, uh, in the language. And so, and because of some of the flaws I found in the NIST standard, where they give the units of Planck's constant over the speed of light, the same unit as um, Planck's constant over the speed of light squared. Okay, which is this one up here. So these are given the same units. This makes me very suspicious of the whole language because this language is what defines quantum mechanics and light theory. And so um, it's my opinion that there can be a different language. Okay, we don't have to use the same language. In my language, I get the right answer and I get it using a very simple logic that I can understand and follow. I don't have to invoke a, a new fundamental particle called the photon or any other of the um, strange things that you find in the language of quantum mechanics. So um, the problem is with the language, in my opinion, and I am trying to fix that. I'm trying to rewrite the program. I'm trying to um, just rethink what is really going on under the hood. And so that is why I'm making my videos. Uh, these videos actually help me because it, in order for me to make a video, I have to really think about what I'm saying. And so this helps me um, formalize my ideas. And so um, anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm just going to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and um, I'll be back.